the technology had progressed enormously because we have experience from giving it to Siachen. We have experience for giving it to Antarctica, to the mountaineering, to Everest expeditions, to world sailing expeditions, naval, all defense people, not to civilians. Wonderful. So we have learned a lot. And of course, we have come much further now. And uh, I'm sure uh, you can see our uh, supermarkets are full of products. We didn't have them at that time. There are hardly any supermarket foods. The private industries themselves do so much on their own. Before a research lab can do it, they're <clears> very innovative, whether they import it or that they figured out. So we have a lot of choice now and good packaging. And we have FSSAI who will enforce standards. Although we had Bureau of Indian Standards then, but nobody had heard of FACE standards. Yeah. So either we had NASA or Russia. So mm. we consulted both. And we had no internet also, ma'am. So we had to um, okay, struggle for information. And we got it. And uh, we are far ahead in technology now. So when right. and if the Gaganyan or whatever they send our astronauts, I hope there will be a woman too, but they don't talk of a woman yet. There are only men astronauts or cosmonauts or Gaganyatras. Uh, there will be quite a lot of stuff. I think they're preparing. I'm not in the know-how right now, but I'm sure my colleagues are doing it in the defense laboratory. And uh, we'll come to hear of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that was fascinating. Yeah, it's a bit <laughs> of some Yeah. Ah, Murli. Ah. Yeah, yeah. You try now. Just log in again. Log in again. Log in again. Log in again. Yeah, you can start, Mahesh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, <clears throat> I want to welcome everybody today for this third monthly lecture series uh, on scientists who have lived so that humanity lives longer and healthier. A fascinating topic uh, by KK Biotech, uh, sponsored by KK Biotech, and today actually we have a very exciting lecture on the scientific genius of Louis Pasteur and uh, his discoveries that actually changed the world and I would also say saved the world. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to it as I'm sure all my audience today is. Um, so the way that today's uh, lecture will go on in, in the first part of the program, we have Professor Kanan who will tell us about the major discoveries of Louis Pasteur uh, and he'll speak about no, 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 molecular... A lot of people are waiting. Just one minute. Yeah, yeah, um, that's fine. Mm. So, should I continue or? Uh, yeah, continue, like... continue. Okay, okay. So, Professor Kanan will tell us about the major discoveries of Louis Pasteur with a focus on his discovery on molecular chirality and how the spontaneous regeneration theory was ultimately resolved by the work of Louis Pasteur. And I think he'll also talk a little bit about the work on vaccines. And which would, uh, you know, nicely lead us to our second very, very exciting talk by Dr. Eddie Syed, who is the executive director at the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And he'll tell us about uh, vaccine manufacturing technologies, which is really the, you know, the need of the hour. We are hearing so much about vaccines in the, in the past year and so. So very much looking forward to uh, both of the exciting talks today and uh, with that um, I would uh, introduce the first speaker of uh, today's series Professor Kanan it's an absolute honor and pleasure to introduce him uh, he's regarded as you know very rightfully so as the pioneer of biotechnology in India both in terms of developing it as an area of education uh, in academics in schools and in universities I'm a product of that and also in uh, industry and other research institutions. Uh, Professor Kanan, as I'm sure this audience doesn't need uh, you know, this introduction, but I'll say it for the benefit of people who have you know, joined us for the first time. 
So Professor Kanan did his PhD in biochemistry from Mysore University, and he started his research career at uh, at that time it was a newly established center, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology at in Hyderabad, which we you know just call now CCMB. And he established the first state of the art protein sequencing lab there. And uh, this this is something that I was surprised to know, uh, Kanan sir, that you were interested in education right from the beginning. So uh, you initiated this, you know, the biochemical education for students and teachers, a program which is called as the best program at the national level. And later on, moved to Pune University, uh, to University of Pune, uh, to establish one of the first postgraduate program in biotechnology in India. Uh, Professor Kanan then had a stint in industry, but then in 1999, and thankfully so, thankfully so you moved back to academics to establish, uh, you know, the program at Indraprasth University, which is the B.Tech and M.Tech program in biotechnology. And since it, its inception, it has run as one of the top biotech programs in the country with great success, motivated scores of students, including me, uh, to pursue research as a career and um, I, I strongly feel that you know it was right at its inception it was actually a very very well designed uh, course curriculum uh, which uh, you know kind of prepared students who were uh, who joined the program for a research career and uh, he played a pivotal role in designing this course curriculum he then uh, moved on to become the vice chancellor at Nagaland Central University. And in his tenure, several new initiatives were taken there, which allowed for enhanced learning and teaching, connecting the campus to the rest of the country, enabling lectures under the national program for enhanced learning, and making a big impact uh, at, uh, in, at this Nagaland uh, Central University. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite uh, Kanan sir, as I, as I call him, and I've called him so, uh, for delivering his lecture on Louis Pasteur. Yeah, yes. And I will. Huh? In one minute, yeah, yeah. One mile start again. Why is it troubling so much today? Just one. Just one. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all of you and good morning to my friends from US. Um, I'm very happy that, you know, such kind words were spoken by Dr. Mehak Sharma, who has been, you know, we have been very proud of her. Uh, she has done extremely well and, you know, she has several papers in Nature and Journal of Cell Biology and she's also in the editorial board. Uh, more about it you can read from the net. Uh, due to paucity of time, I don't want to spend so much time. But thank you so much, Mahek, for a very kind introduction. And um, I begin that. Before we begin, I thought I must say why I started this KK Biotech. The idea essentially is to inspire, ideate, and implement. So as you can see, um, today when I go to universities or colleges, children are a bit disillusioned why I took biotechnology. And that upset me very much because I had such a beautiful bunch of students who were so excited about the subject. And today when I go around, they think uh, there is no future for biotechnology. So the whole aim essentially is to how to bring back that positive image into the whole field. 
Professor Kannan, you can make it uh, full screen. Yeah, no, this is the only short one because you can't read okay. it away. It's already full screen, isn't it? It's not full screen. No, it's not. It, um, is it not, okay? not yet. Oh boy, let me. Not in the presentation mode, sir. Yeah, so you have to just click on the I, full screen. No, I'm on the full screen only from here. I can see it as full screen. The presentation guess, mode yeah. bottom. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did. Just one sec. Let me get out again and do it. Huh? Yeah, I'll just start again. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you're sh uh, you are sharing your whole desktop, right? That way it works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Is it okay now? <clears throat> no, we can't see the presentation right now. It's a problem. You know, ma, what is it going wrong today? We're not able to see at all. Not right now, no. The presentation is to... not selected. You can see my screen. We can see your yes. screen. So why uh, there are so many multiple images in that you're sharing you need to choose the presentation it's not chosen yeah, yeah no I'll, I'll do that but uh, yeah. i'm in presentation mode only sorry yeah I'm just... no, no, that's fine Is it see? Uh, can you see it now? Uh, no, we are still seeing the screen. Uh, the Google Meet screen is visible right now. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll just log out and do it again. Okay. Mm, if you don't mind, so I'll just stop. So That's okay. We'll just wait for a few minutes. Yes. Kanan sir, you are muted. Sorry, are you able to see? Um, screen is seen now. Screen is seen. Screen we see yes, but now if you go to the presentation, hmm? you are able to see the screen now. Yes, we can see the hey. screen. You need to share the presentation. 
Yeah, I'm sharing only. So, no, so you must open the presentation, then it will be. Yes, no, it's not yes. open yet. It is open. My end here. No, we are still seeing the screen. Yeah. So, avoid mirroring. Don't share your entire. And you need to share it. You need to click share. Just one minute. I'll just uh, sort it. It never has. Just one minute. Let me just see. Sir, if you just open your PPT, that is what will be visible to us. Yeah, I opened the PPT. Are you seeing it? I am seeing it. I see. And now if you just go on share your entire screen, let's do uh, that. Yeah, I'm just trying then. Are you able to see? Mm, it's still the Google Meet screen which is appearing. Yeah, now okay. Now go to the full full screen mode. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Sorry that's for okay. the delay. I wait. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'll just start. No, no okay. worries. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so basically. Uh, the, you know, the whole idea of starting this was uh, to how to bridge the gap between academic pursuit and the real world so that has to make the children employable. So we just did an experiment a uh, few days, you know, last month um, where we chose uh, four areas to, uh, you know, do the training for about 20 students. And so the first week did the, we did the revision of concepts, you know, which are very exciting today, like proteomic, genomic, cytometry, and all that. Second week, we showed them clinical application of hematopoiesis, how to apply it for bone marrow transplantation, cord blood banking, et cetera. Third week, we had a beautiful session on protein sequencing, how LCMS is used, how high throughput proteomics is done, how single cell proteomics is done. Fourth week, we had a series of lectures on cytometry, then they did COVID genomics live calculation. Okay, what are the variants, delta, alpha, beta, etc. Then how to do metagenomics. Then we had a very nice session which is so relevant today, which is food preservation, technology, and regulatory issues. It was presented by one of my old college mates, uh, who is very well known for technologists. Who you know, when I heard his lecture, I was always reminded what a great work Pasteur himself did, which we just now heard Dr. Vijaya Rao sharing with us about the space program, how to make things are free from bacterial infection came out so well. OK, so uh, this one has come out very well. And uh, now it has convinced us that this is one of the ways to do it. And children were given assignment. They had to give it. Those who have submitted assignment, they were given badges. I request you to go through the activities page uh, of the uh, fakebiotech.net. Now, today, uh, I thought, you know, Eddie is going to speak on the vaccine side of it. But I thought uh, very few, you know, whenever I ask students, what is uh, pasture famous for? First thing they say is pasteurization. I haven't seen even a single student ever saying that he is the discoverer of molecular chilarity. And, you know, his work was the one which is the most outstanding piece of work uh, of of so many centuries because it, he was the first man who said look uh, the difference between an organic and inorganic is really due to the chirality of the molecule now to appreciate why his work is so great it is very important that you know before 1848 1848 9th october is the time when he presented his work but it is very important we only talked about empirical formula molecular formula which all of us did in school without knowing why it was done atomic theory did not exist isomers were known but there was no explanation people are trying to explain about crystal structure one of the great people is mitserlis who you know uh, who, who really looked at tartrate and his letter to uh, Biot, with whom um, uh, 
um, you know, Louis Pasteur did his research, uh, had noted that he had two types of tartaric acid. One is called tartaric acid and the other is paratartrate. And one of them has, could rotate, you know, uh, in a polarimeter, the optical rotation or showed optical activity, whereas the paratartrate did not. So that was the challenge of those times. Nobody understood what it was. In fact, uh, you must appreciate that uh, um, there was no valency concept. We didn't know carbon is tetravalent. We did not know. We only knew about specification of atomic masses. In fact, the tetrahedral carbon concept came only in the 1874 by Van Hoff and Label. And then, you know, uh, you had a binary, you know, physical chemistry developed. We talked about NHMS. And only in 1913, crystals, first crystal structure was solved. So it is very interesting to see that uh, why uh, Pasteur was uh, important in this whole discovery. You know, uh, just after his uh, PhD, you know, he got a PhD in uh, chemistry and physics. So he was basically more into the physics of uh, chemistry than biology in any way. And uh, this figure, these are uh, uh, two isomers of um, paratritate, there's a potassium ammonium titrate or sodium ammonium tartrate. Uh, whichever. So this is the sodium ammonium tartrate. Mind you, a lot of people had looked at the crystal structure before. And none of them could see the minor difference, which is shown in colored, as you can see. This one and this one. So the minor phase showed a very interesting one, which Louis Pasteur could spot, which none of these people who worked and all the big names could not spot this. So here's a look. There are two mirror images which are existing. And if I separate them and I take the crystal and dissolve it in solution, one rotated the light to the left, uh, what is called levorotatory, and one which rotated to the right, which was called the dextrorotatory. So it was an amazing observation that his, um, his guru, with whom he worked by art, uh, didn't believe the result because he was hardly 26 years old, and he comes and shows. So Bayot made him repeat the whole set of experiments in front of him. He gave him the sodium ammonium tartrate. He said, now you crystallize it, show me. And you won't believe. Bayot just couldn't believe. And he, and he was an 80-year-old man. And he went to the French Academy and presented and said, this is the first thing. And Pasteur was the first one who said that you have dextrorotatory and levorotatory compound without knowing why it was happening. Okay, so that is why it is the, what we today what we call as chirality because chirality word came from this only. Okay, and what he did was, uh, you know, paratritrate. It's a racemic mixture. Racemic in the, uh, the 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 Latin word is for grapes. Okay, because tartrate was obtained from grape, so this racemic mixture was racemic word. What came from that? Now, how did this racemic mixture happen? Because uh, grapes only have uh, one form, which is the optically active tartaric acid. Then it was discovered that during the manufacture of tartaric acid, heating steps are involved, which leads to isomerization. So you get both the levorotatory and dextrorotatory. So Louis Pasteur went around the fact checked up all this saying this is not a natural compound and he had the confidence to say look it is man-made and not naturally occurring so that much of insight it has okay so uh, there have been a lot of stories around his discovery uh, some people said there is a myth that he presented on 15th may but actually he presented apparently on 26 may 1848 that was and um, he did not mention much about it at that time Final work came a bit later in October, and uh, a lot of people said uh, he had seen Mr. Lee's note to Bayard, but they say that no, he was only an undergraduate student, and I don't think he would have had chance. Because a lot of historians have done a lot of work, what actually Louis Pasteur did and what he didn't do it. So, uh, and as I said, Bayard made him repeat. Interestingly, from 86 to, uh, 46 to 47, actually Louis Pasteur was trained by a man called Lauren. Okay, Anthony Lauren, who was a strong believer in atomic theory, and he could tell him about space, 
you know how the molecule atoms might be arranged etc but the most dominant person was a man called jb dumas uh, who did not believe in atomic theory so dumas and loren did not get along and later probably loren had to leave the institute okay so um, now you will say did he think about octopega activity answer is no because when he was working with loren one of the ways to look at it was essentially that um, we uh, look for amount of water content present. So when he struggled to look at this racemic mixture which he has resolved, he found that it was very difficult to measure the water content. So out of frustration, he said, let me characterize this. So one of the characterization was using polarimeter. And during that time, he had a whole lot of crystals. It was not just this. He had aspartic acid crystals. He had acid crystals, malic acid crystals, etc. A whole range of them were there. Okay. So in the process, only in tartrate, he could do a clean job. The rest, he couldn't do it. Okay. So that was his, this thing. So it was the, so he had so many, but when he presented his PhD thesis, he said, I have some interesting observation in tartrate and just left it. He did not present it as his PhD work. His PhD work was something else. Okay. So now you might say, why did he succeed? Why others not succeed? Okay. Uh, because he believed in microscopy so he used to look everything under a microscope and the uh, whereas chemists never use microscope in their work at that time so chemists were very much never believed in using microscope so he was the first man who built the gap between chemists and microscopists as you know robert Hooke knew about in 1665 introduced the cell concept leeuwenhoek schwann latour saw yeast etc how they grow etc spallanzani had you know demonstrated that theory of spontaneous generation is wrong uh, so and that is where louis pasteur you might ask he was a physicist and a chemist how come he was interested in fermentation of all things because when the commercially available um, tartrate was available and what he found somebody had reported that fermentation was happening when tartrate is put there so what he found was that uh, when he examined the, this thing, there was tartrate left. One form of tartrate was left behind, and only the other form of tartrate is only taken up. Today, we know in the modern sense that we only have these sugars in our body. We have only L amino acids. But at that time, he found that this one. So he basically worked on uh, sodium ammonium tartrate, uh, basically. Potassium hydrogen tartrate is what is found in the uh, grapes okay and that particular one turned his interest into fermentation otherwise he would have probably gone into crystallography and other things that's what people say then at that time he was interested in fermentation because everybody all the chemists believed that oxygen was required and in food preservation one of the oldest methods was to remove the oxygen and flush it with nitrogen and uh, close the cap uh, interestingly uh, what he found, he proved that, no, 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 oxygen has nothing to do with it. Uh, it has to do with the uh, globule, with what he could see under the microscope, the yeast, which is responsible for it. Now, to prove that oxygen is not necessary, when he studied butyric acid fermentation, he discovered that it is an uh, anaerobic organism. So thereby, he disproved that there are aerobic, there are anaerobic, and then he said, uh, at that time, uh, as you know, the industry had a lot of problem with the uh, wine industry, which was the main thing. So he analyzed that and he developed this pasteurization method. Then he got into this controversy of spontaneous regeneration. And the last slide, when I will show you, I'll show you how brilliantly he used swan neck flask to demonstrate. So he was a very brilliant piece of experiment. Then what happened was uh, his uh, Dumas was very keen place there are a lot of silk industry and all the silk worms are dying so Dumas said you go and work there but Dumas he told Dumas sir I've never touched an insect in my life what do you explain he said that's very good you don't you don't know anything about it you will give a new perspective and that's how he did it and he said okay what are what is flattery happening you know a whole lot of things he studied and uh, he also showed how to disinfect these eggs you know and how to clean up the house okay and then of course today you're going to hear from uh, eddie more about all these things 
so that's the yeah. another one and his greatest contribution is on rabbit dox which is a prophylactic vaccine okay so this is what i've tried to summarize over here and uh, you can see uh, you know here you can see the wine uh, thing and he is talking about us, uh, how to sterilize before filling it everything so that there's no contamination here he is doing an anthrax vaccination here he is doing the rabies it's a cartoon which is made pastor himself goes to buy the pasteurized milk now he was so committed to research that there was a franco prussian war going on mm. and he still was devoted to his science and his country so that is the so he was such a committed and passionate scientist for us what i liked about him when he said in may one of his writings in it is in the sciences certain persons have conviction others have only opinions conviction supposes proof opinion generally rest upon hypothesis so we generally hear a lot of opinions even today about covid but there are very few people with conviction what really is happening i think what he has said at that time is as much valid as today of course uh, there are a lot of competitors for louis pasteur and he never acknowledged them that is one of his negative aspects for the infectious diseases for example say when you look at robert koch he who discovered the uh, you know anthrax he did as well as he showed the cost postulate so that he did it before this thing but he never acknowledged him even jenner he has not acknowledged he said indians knew about vaccination before that you know then he uh, carbolic acid was beautifully used he had predicted that carbolic acid will prevent if you don't allow the microorganisms to get into a wounded person you can do carbolic acid or and what lister did was essentially use that during his surgery very effectively okay uh, certainly attenuation he there a lot of other people also did tusain was one of the people who developed and didn't get the credit much much later the french government <laughs> that he had done it okay i just want to say that uh, you know when you look at pasteur's work it is famous what is called pasteur's squadron so there are pure basic research which may have no direct benefit immediate you have what is called use inspired basic research what what pasteur did thomas alva edison only did pure applied research and there are people who just tinker around the existing and slightly improve <coughs> it so as you can see relevance of generalized knowledge goes up whereas relevance of immediate application on the x axis so pasteur is always quoted as the man who you who basic knowledge effectively to uh, you know to do the inspire whether it is making a beer in fact there is a beer named at a pasteur beer because they had to compete with the german you will see all along uh, he tried to see how to beat the germans at their game so that is one of his hallmark and throat so that nationalistic he was okay so uh, i just want to start end my saying by saying that i have emphasized research i think he is one of the best researchers i have ever seen and he knew how to develop an idea he could publicly demonstrate and he could spread the idea in fact uh, he was one of the first biotechnology who sold his product and in the process created the pasteur institute so uh, in fact many times i feel that uh, he was the first man who bridged the gap between chemistry and life i think it is uh, this thing and secondly he had excellent mentors in loren biot dumas in developing a scientific temper in fact i always feel we should teach children scientific method or research methodology from what louis pasteur has done because they are much easier to appreciate than what is a positive control negative control he did some amazing work because i have read his biography and it is an amazing piece of work okay and then um, uh, he also uh, you know the concept of pasteurization heating you know at 72 degrees you know he understood sterilization cotton plugging you know all those which we see today all were formulated which is amazing about that man that he could think so much and he had that chemistry way of looking at everything so i don't know whether to call him a chemist or a microbiologist immunologist or an entrepreneur or a translator science or combination of everything i told you neck the 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 swan neck one which is the right one so when he took two flask one without the snack you know swan neck and another one 
and you put some meat or anything which will readily get fermented you boil the uh, this thing kill all the bacteria expose it to air the first one which was exposed to air there was bacterial growth whereas the one where he had just twisted the neck so that it looks like a swan's neck the air was going which is what liebig was saying but there was no fermentation if you till this flask and go to the u part and put back that into it immediately it gets fermented by showing that dust particles have bacteria or viruses in them which sit there so this was his outstanding design which he did okay so i want to close here that uh, pasteur uh use his chemistry knowledge very effectively and uh, i think it is something amazing about that man i still can't uh, say uh, you know how could such a man think so brilliantly so thank you so much yeah over to you man yeah, yeah thank you karan sir that was very fascinating i i never realized that you know uh, louis pasteur because as you said he was he has been only famous in the minds of uh, you know lay people for pasteurization but uh, that he discovered uh, so many things uh, discovered the concept of chirality uh, was never known and i agree with you when you say that he was you know one of the greatest researchers and greatest thinkers of our times yeah so uh, if there are any audience uh, comments um, <coughs> we can take them now Can I have a question? I'm Dr. Jagannath. Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kannan. Yeah. The last experiment yeah. that you have shown. Yes. Far-reaching, far-reaching uh, results that it has. What it shows, yes. as as you are also mentioning, that uh, life is not a spontaneous process. Yes. This demolishes uh, several theories that are going around on the origin of life and evolutionary theories. Yes. For example. if life is coming from just from elements and some yes. molecules and somehow life is formed after combination of these molecules yes demolishes this because yes. when i was conducting some of the young investigators programs in ccmb i conducted for around 5 to 7 years and i used to ask the students now we have technology to look at all the molecules for example if i take a bacteria we can give you the complete genome sequence the complete proteome and all the molecules that it will have so if a spontaneous formation of life is possible if we give all these molecules can anyone in the globe form life with these molecules in the given proportion yes the answer till now nobody says no this is where this is where we started a big form at science and scientist and we have been conducting series of meetings annually and we certainly invite a lot of senior scientists and students to participate in that that uh, life comes from life this is vedantic view vedantic view says life come from life matter comes from life and uh, li the other way matter does not go to the life okay so therefore life come from life at what is the beginning and ending people will ask them what could be the beginning vedantic view clearly says that there is neither beginning nor ending it is a continuous process i this agree is, this i agree thanks so therefore on this particular concept because this demolishes the theory uh, including that of the darwins so therefore yeah. there is a huge big hue and cry that this is this is very difficult and you cannot speak this way therefore intelligent design came you know in uh, western countries some people want to push a theory of intelligent design of course we, are, we also demolish the theory of intelligent design through experimental processes yeah. is a different subject but this yeah. louis pasteur experiment is yeah. a scientific proof to say yes. life come from life and it does yeah. not come from molecules and atoms okay just yes. to make this comment very true very true very true thank you so much yeah over to mai yeah yeah that okay. was uh, that was very well put professor jagannathan so uh, anybody else uh, are there any other audience questions or comments we can have it in the end i think okay all yeah. right yeah. all right well then uh, let's move on to our second exciting talk of the day and again it is an honor to introduce our second speaker uh, today that is dr edi sayed uh, so dr sayed did his uh, bachelor's in zoology from university of pune 
which is now known as Savitri Bhai uh, Phule University. And he was actually the first batch uh, of, you know, biotechnology uh, graduates. He did his master's in biotechnology from University of Pune and was the first batch in that program. Um, and as I know from Kanan, sir, that uh, many of, um, you know, Dr. Sayed's classmates actually went on to do very well. Um, so seems like that the program right at its inception was, you know, very well put together. Um, Dr. Sayed then went on to do his uh, PhD in biotechnology from the National Institute of Virology, where he worked on uh, non-structural proteins of the Japanese encephalitis virus. And this was in 1994. And uh, after his PhD, he joined uh, the Serum Institute of India that we, you know, we have heard a lot about uh, because of the development of the Covishield vaccine now. Um, so he, he worked with Serum Institute of India from 94 to 2000, where he uh, developed the general manufacturing practices for the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And uh, he had a short stint at Commonwealth Serum Laboratories uh, at Melbourne, Australia, working on influenza vaccines uh, from 2001 to 2002. And since 2002, uh, he has been... Uh, you know, associated with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative and is now the Executive Director and Product Development, uh, uh, you know, involved in the product development of almost more than 50 HIV candidate vaccines under this initiative. And uh, his research is involved using variety of viral vectors, a variety of pathogens of HIV and related viruses, uh, under the development of this vaccine. And he has used, um, you know, VSP, ves uh, vesicular stomatitis virus platform also to develop uh, vaccines for variety of the viral pathogens, um, including, um, as I understand, SARS coronavirus uh, two vaccines. Um, so it is a, you know, it is a very, very impressive uh, experience in the field of vaccine development. And we are very much looking forward uh, to your talk today, Professor Sayed, uh, on vaccine manufacturing technologies. Um, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, so over to you. Um, hi, Mehek. Uh, thanks so, so much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining this call. Uh, Mehek, just a reality check. Am I coming through all right in terms of audio? You are coming audio? through all right. Yes, we can hear you. And, and is my presentation in the right mode? Yes, yes. OK, That's great. And uh, Mahek, maybe I'll just make a request is if people can go on mute because uh, there are some okay. background noises coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. Eddie, can... you can also make it full screen. Yes, yeah, Sudhir, I'm trying I that. I'm not, I'm not sure what's happening, you know. OK, yeah, that's fine. We can see it. Well. Your your screen is pretty visible, but I agree. Yeah, you are not in the full screen mode. So is it possible to do that? I'm I'm actually clicking on that. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Maybe same problem like Dr. Kannan, you know. Okay. Um, I think we can go ahead because I can, yes. uh, and I think others can see your first slide clearly. I would also request everybody to please keep your microphones on mute. Okay, good. Sudhir, I don't want to mess up the uh, presentation, but uh, I'm, I'm just giving one more try. Just let me know. Sure, yeah. OK, I, you know, let's let's go yeah, ahead. Let's and see it. It. Yes, let's go ahead. We can see it. Yeah, we, you okay. can see it. Yeah, go ahead. And, and, and Mahek, just one other reality check. How much time do we have? I think we have, um, I think we have 40, 40 minutes or so. OK, uh, so I'll try my best to cover that. And if uh, we are running out of time, just give me a five minute alert. And uh, I know Will it's a Friday, Friday evening mm -hmm. and people probably want to relax. So, uh, you know, good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, for this great opportunity. Thanks, Dr. Kannan, uh, for giving me the forum to actually share with you some of the thoughts. Um, I can promise you this will not be a very scientifically intense but it's going to talk about some of the fantastic uh, achievements that uh, has happened in the field of uh, vaccinology. And um, 
I, I'm going to be actually uh, sharing with you. I, you know, there were some slides that Dr. Kannan uh, and my my presentation have in common. So I'm going to skip those slides as they come. So. Uh, I'm just. There's something not going right here. Yeah, we, are, we are still at the slide one. Yeah, now I think I'm getting it right. Yes. Yes. Finally achieved. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to start with first a dedication, you know, to the scientific community, healthcare professionals, and the vaccine volunteers who continue to play an important role during the COVID-19 epidemic. And, and this has been a phenomenal effort. I also take the opportunity to actually dedicate this presentation to all my teachers. I know it is Guru, Guru Purnima tomorrow, and uh, without our teachers, we are nothing. So thanks so much for all their effort in nurturing us. Uh, 2020 has been an amazing period. I, I consider that to be another scientific renaissance in the field. It has taught us so many new ways of doing things, and hopefully we'll have a lot of lessons learned to move forward. Uh, my agenda for this uh, discussion is going to be in three parts, you know, because we have so many students and Dr. Kannan has talked about mentorship. You know, many of our young students as they are developing their careers are not sure where they are going to go. What is their journey going to be? And they are pretty uncertain about so many things. I thought I'll share with you some insight into my journey and my inspirations. And I'm sure some of you will realize at the end of it, you will make it, you will succeed, and you will be able to make a difference in the world. So just remain steadfast and believe in yourself. The second part of my discussion will be a model of a not-for-profit organization, how we can make a difference in vaccine development. And this is about IRV, the organization I work for. And the third part is actually the meat of this whole presentation, which will talk about the history types, production technologies, and the relevance to HIV and the current SARS co 2 vaccine. Many years ago, I heard this speech from Steve Jobs. And what struck was, you got to find what you love. If you don't love what you do, that means you're not going to enjoy your life. So please, you know, find what you love and pursue that pursuit, because that's going to make the difference between your life. Within that script, he said, of course, it's, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it became very, very clear looking backward 10 years later. And the same thing happens to each one of us. You know, while we are doing our careers, building ourselves, we are not sure what's going to happen in the future. But 10 years later, when you look back, you know that each of these events that occurred in your life have made the difference. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward but you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down and it has made a lot of difference in my life. So believe in yourself and it will make the difference. I'll talk a little bit about my journey and uh, essentially, There were several life changing, changing events in my life. You know, my inspiration has been my mother and my divinity. 
I've always relied relied on them. It has helped me actually strengthen and become what I am today. The second inspiration has been my school and my old teachers. This is from my school grade 10. And these are the galaxy of teachers who made me what I am today. And I'm absolutely in debt to them. Another great change in my life or the milestone was actually my master's MSc Biotechnology and my professors. I have come from the University of Pune, from the batch of the MSc Biotech, the first batch, 1985. And we had wonderful specializations introduced in 1985. And then they were essentially the genetic engineering, molecular biology, the animal cell culture, biochemical engineering, plant tissue culture, and bioinformatics. And it was unheard of during those times to have these wonderful specializations. I was privileged to have a galaxy of professors and teachers who taught me. We were exposure for the first time to translation science. We were given the opportunity to, of doing industry internship. Men, most of our batch, actually, I think 100% of our batch who applied for the CSR UGC exam actually got that scholarship to be able to do our PhDs. And that was also a time when several national institutes were launched. A great era for science in India. After I completed my PhD, I moved on to Serum Institute of India. You know, while doing my PhD, it became very clear to me that my orientation was not academics. I wanted to get into translation. And this was the greatest achievement for me. Serum Institute of India has made me what I am. I'm absolutely in debt to them today. After having worked seven to eight years at Serum Institute, I moved overseas. First, I went to Australia, and then I went to New York City. And then I moved over in US. I'm, I'm working for this group called IRP, International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. This is going to be our 25th year anniversary, and I'm going to be completing 20 years in February. My gratitude to so many different people, you know, my mother and my family, my school, especially one of my teachers who actually was my greatest and the first mentor in my life. The zoology department, a galaxy of professors who were there, amazing teachers who devoted themselves to us. Then I worked at the National Facility for Animal Tissue Culture, which later is being called now as NCCS. Then I did my PhD at the National Institute of Virology and Serum Institute. This is where I got my first break in life. I happened to meet Dr. Seth Berkeley, who was a former CEO of IAVI and currently is heading Gavi. And Dr. Wayne Koff was a CSO at the, uh, at the uh, IAVI organization. And currently, the president of our organization is uh, Mike Feinberg. A few pictures of some great people. You know, this is my school. I continue to meet people. In fact, in February 2020, I was in India. And I had a get together of my batch. And we had over 60 guys from a batch of 110 who attended this function. I, I continue to meet my teachers and keep in touch with them. This is Professor Modak, who made a lot of difference during the biotech program, along with the other teachers. We met Professor Modak many, many years ago with a couple of my friends. Some of them are who are in the audience. I continue to meet my teachers, Dr. Kannan, who has been a great inspiration, Dr. Deobakas, who have been wonderful, Dr. Gadkari, with whom I did my PhD, Dr. Kalen Banerjee, of, uh, the head of National Institute of Virology, and this amazing man, Dr. Cyrus Poonawala. He's brilliant. He's made a difference in the world on vaccines. And these are the other mentors who have helped me. So I'm extremely gratified for actually making a difference and showing me the path and, and helping me where what I am today. I'll move to part two of the presentation and talk about Ayavi as a model. Basically, in 1994, the AIDS epidemic was escalating, and there wasn't any significant effort done on vaccines. And that led to the identification of Ayavi, totally focused on developing HIV vaccines. Our CEO was Seth Berkeley. And later on, you can see the timelines. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but what we did is we tested our first vaccine in Africa in 2001. We continue to work on neutralizing antibodies. We continue to invest our time in Kenya to do clinical studies. We look at early studies in terms of determining HIV infection 
and how the immune responses uh, responses to the to the infection and the evolution of HIV. We did our first HIV clinical trial in India. Uh, this was done in Chennai, and later on, we also did another study in at Nari. Uh, we have a laboratory in Brooklyn uh, called the IRV Design and Development Lab. And the history continues, and I'm not really going to go into the details, but what we most important significant change was we developed a product development center that actually helps principal investigators in the field to move their ideas into translation and undertake clinical studies. In 2020, we collaborated with Merck to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine based on the VSV platform. What are the challenges of AIDS vaccine development? Number one, it integrates into the host cell DNA. It infects and suppresses and destroys the immune cells. The HIV antigens that are needed for protection continue to remain unidentified. The natural infection does not actually lead to immunity. We have many different HIV isolates and they're hypervariable. Animal models are not very predictive. It takes extremely long to do clinical studies. And another thing that actually makes it very complicated is the germline targeting that takes several years to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies. What we now know that in order to get a good immune response, you need a balanced neutralizing antibody response as well as a cell mediated response. The neutralizing antibody should block the virus at its point of entry. And in case some virus infects the cell, the CMI or the cell mediated immune response should blunt that infection. Hence, it's important to actually have a balanced response. A vaccine should be able to elicit both arms of the immune system. What is IRV's role? What is unique about IRV? So if you know, the basic research is typically done by public sectors and academics, universities, and the commercialization is done by big pharma. In any new vaccine development, especially in HIV, this translation of basic research to commercialization is a difficult part. And this is called the valley of death because this is the time when most of the candidates fail. So what IRV did is this is IRV's niche. We fitted this gap. We work with basic scientists, principal scientists who have ideas, and we drive their concept into vaccine development and do phase one, phase two clinical studies. And we are hoping that the big pharma would come and take it over for commercialization. How do we achieve this? Through our internal and external laboratory capacity, product development, and clinical trial network in, in East and uh, Southern Africa, India, US, and Europe. Over a period of time, we have continued to evolve and currently our mission has changed. What we are currently now doing is we are going to be focusing on HIV and TB and along with this, working on different infectious diseases. So as here, we are going to be, we continue to work on HIV. We have a big program on tuberculosis. We are doing many, many different clinical studies with emerging infectious diseases like Lassa fever, Marburg, Ebola, and other neglected diseases which will come into the pipeline. We have a product development center that has experts from the industry with experience in handling all the platforms. And we can take any of the infectious diseases from concept into clinical studies. Our six impact areas are basically HIV. HIV continues to be uh, our main aim. We will continue to work on HIV development. We'll work on HIV antibodies as passive protection strategies. TB program is the biggest killer in the world. So we have many phase three clinical studies occurring. EID stands for emerging infectious diseases like the Lassa fever, Marburg, Ebola, SARS-CoV-2. And I would say any pandemic X that would come in, we would work on it. We are also looking at actually doing innovative research to generate antibodies to snake bite. Uh, in order for treatment. And our product development center will tackle any problems that are emerge in the field. This is our essential portfolio, HIV vaccines, tuberculosis, Lassa fever. We just started a clinical study uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, we, have, uh, we are developing a Marburg vaccine. We have applied for a grant for Ebola and hopefully we should get it very soon.
We collaborated on developing a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. In terms of the antibodies, we are working on HIV antibodies as passive protection, snake bite antibodies, antibodies against enteric bacterial antibodies, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, and our platforms would be discovery, optimization, development, and global access. I'm really privileged, I must say, during my 20 years of tenure at IRV, I have been able to work on all the different platforms, plasmid DNA, RNA, bacterial delivery systems, monoclonal antibodies, HIV immunogenic, uh, and several viral, viral vectors. We work exclusively with a lot of contract manufacturing organization and contract research organization based all over the globe. And these are the number of candidates for each of the platform that we have worked about nine of them for the DNA, two of them for the RNA, and you can see so many of them for the viral vectors. And this figure in the last column actually is the number of clinical trials you have done. So you can see our success rate is almost 50%. How do we manage these programs? We have expertise in all the different platforms. We have a project team concept that has a leader in science, manufacturing, quality, preclinical regulatory medical affairs. We work on that program along with the principal investigator. We take programs from the external principal investigator or it could be an IRV internal program and we drive it into clinical studies. We work with external contractors for the manufacturing activities. We don't have our own GMP facilities. More recently, we, were, we have worked with a lot of principal investigators. Uh, we have worked on passive antibodies, replicating vectors, that is vesicular stomatitis virus, canine distemper virus, as a vector for HIV vaccines, HCME as, as a vector for HIV vaccine, AD26 as a vector for HIV vaccines. We have worked on antibodies, and we are also working on adjuvants. And all these have entered into clinical trials under the umbrella of the Product Development Center. This is our current pipeline for 2021 to 2023. Our main focus is different structures of the HIV envelope protein. Uh, a lot of them on the antibodies as passive protection. And our VSV based platform is extensive. We have envelope, uh, HIV envelope, Marburg, Lhasa, uh, Ebola, SARS-CoV-2. And we also have a strong TB program. How do we achieve this? This is through our funders, and our funders essentially for our effort are basically the PREFA, the USAID, Bill Gates, Melinda Foundation, the World Bank, and we are greatly in debt to all these funders for making this possible for us. I, I completed my part two of my presentation. Are there any burning questions at this point? <clears throat> So if there are any audience questions, we can take them now from the first part. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Shana, you can go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Myself is Suri. Yeah. And uh, this is regarding a question on SARS-CoV. Considering that uh, uh, all the RNA virus, the single standard RNA virus, positive and virus, uh, multiply through RDRP. So how far like targeting RDRP of COVID uh, would help because like uh, we have done uh, with a partner uh, clinical trials in US using polio vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 and we have found that uh, the neutralizing antibody against RDRP has uh, like significant effect on <coughs> COVID. So how far do you think as far as experience with RNA viruses like, tag, uh, like, instead of targeting spike protein, do we have a better version on uh, RDRP as such? And can yeah, polio you know, vaccine can, uh, okay, uh, polio vaccine can, either IPV or OPV can be used for SARS because we are unable to find a manufacturers in India who can come up with our uh, clinical trial results to go for CDESCO uh, mm -hmm. to get the polio vaccine to be used for SARS COVID because we have tried with all manufacturers in India. But unfortunately, no one is coming up to put an application uh, for polio vaccine to be used for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, it's, it's a great 
It's a great question. Uh, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take the question in the end because my third part of my presentation will talk about vaccines and SARS-CoV-2. So it would probably be more appropriate to answer that question in that forum. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah if you can. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Mahek, I think there is still someone, uh, some people who have kept their mics on. I'm getting a lot of background noise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sohan Modak has a question to ask. He's raising yes. his finger. Well, Eddie, I want to ask you a question about COVID vaccine. And the issue is that everybody is going for a spike protein. But why is there no attempt to have spike plus the, uh, uh, the, the proteins which are next to it together? I don't mean a polyclonal in terms of uh, the total virus, but taking sequences which are no, next to each other because there are a lot of mutations that are taking place site-specific mutation and this is something might be interesting to make a combination of three different uh, domains which are next to each other next to each other that is on the either side of the spike in along with the spike to make that vaccine what do you okay. think about it yeah dr dr Murdoch, greetings to you and um, you know i'm i'm so glad i'm privileged that you're you're attending this call and, and for the benefit of folks, you know, uh, Dr. Kanan, uh, Dr. Modak is a very, very special person for us. Uh, he was instrumental in getting the uh, MSc Biotechnology, uh, and he's a great mentor for all of us, and he continues to inspire us. So thank you, Dr. Modak, for your great inspiration. Uh, Dr. Modak, I'm going to be talking about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in my next session. So uh, can, can I make a request that we address that at that point so we can talk about all the different types of vaccines? Uh, it would probably be placed better in that session. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Eddie, can I ask a question? Yes, so this please. This is more, uh, more related to HIV. I think you said uh, the natural infection does not lead to immunity. Uh, is it primarily because the immune cells are eventually uh, killed by the virus or is there any other reason for this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just uh, you know, what you call this polish up that response a little bit. You do get an immune response. You get, okay. you get binding antibodies, but those antibodies are not protective and the virus continues to multiply. Uh, and the reason is it has got into the uh, integrated into the host cell genome and you're not able to fish that virus out. So it continues to actually uh, develop virus particles. What we need is a broadly neutralizing antibody that can neutralize the virus and also get rid of the reservoir that is sitting. And that yeah. has been our biggest challenge. Okay. Read about it. Yeah, thank you. So maybe we can move on now. Yeah, and, and Mahek, just note down those two questions and I'll address them in the in last session, you know. Okay, sure, sure. So the third part of my presentation is I'm going to be talking about history of vaccines, the types, the production technologies and relevance to current uh, HIV and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And um, uh, 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 some of it will be very basic for, for the students, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly. So, you know, folks who are new, uh, what are vaccines? They may make the disease causing agent. Uh, it could be a bacteria, it could be a virus. It stimulates the body's defense system to build a protective response without the risk of causing the disease. Most important is generates memory, which is really important. If a vaccine cannot generate memory, it may not be a very effective vaccine. And most important is that the subsequent encounter of the pathogen should be rapid, uh, immune response should be rapid and effective. These are the characteristics one needs in a vaccine. And what, what is really important is to present the antigen in the best mimic uh, to the pathogen or the agent that actually leads to causing the disease. If the structure is distorted, you may get an immune response that may not be effective. In terms of the history, you know, Dr. Kannan talked about it, but I'll just highlight, you know, smallpox was one of the greatest or the first one. There have been records of 1000 CE in China that there was already smallpox inoculation and variolation that was taking place. Edward Jenner uh, introduced the concept of the cowpox. So what they found was 
that the milk mates um, make this someone who is who make it yeah and i was also about to say that can can everybody please turn off their mics actually i cannot mute everyone um, anand sir can we mute uh, the other participants me so, uh, sohan can you mute yours okay. no i'm not. oh should i mute it okay yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. please please do yeah that is that is good you know thank you so much you know okay great thank you so <laughs> yeah ahead. yeah so what we what was observed were the that the milk maids uh, who were in the close proximity of cows um you know th there was a similar disease like smallpox in cows which was called cowpox and these milkmaids uh, because they were handling the cows actually got infected with cowpox but they never came down with a disease as severe as smallpox and they were immune so that led to the concept that you know you could actually have a agent which is similar to the disease causing agent that could give you sterilizing immunity and this was the greatest concept that was identified dr kanan talked about the rabies vaccine basically what louis pasteur did is he took the nerve tissue from an infected rabbit dried it and that actually resulted in weakening the virus and when this was administered into a person that led to an immune response and hence this is one of the greatest achievements of science and the person um, who received was was actually protected after having been bitten by a dog the next few years were amazing you know we identified vaccines to the diphtheria tetanus anthrax cholera plague as well as the typhoid and the tuberculosis the middle of 20th century was a revolution because that gave rise to the modern vaccines like the measles mumps or rubella and currently we are talking about a new era in vaccinology which is based on recombinant dna technology i'll skip this part of the presentation because this was covered by uh, louis pasteur but he's considered as the father of immunology another great discovery was actually this particular scientist max thaler and this is the only nobel prize for virus vaccines what he did was a very amazing task yellow fever virus uh, he took an acb strain and all he did was continue to passage it Uh, between 1935 to 1937 in hundreds of passages in tissue culture and repeatedly tested it for its neurotropic activity and suddenly what they found is around 89 to the 114 passage the virus variants lacked the visotropic and the neurotropic activity and that became the first live attenuated vaccine a hallmark in the field of science now there were many scientists who adopted a similar strategy for other vaccines including yellow fever and they were not su successful so what this tells you is he was really very lucky and sometimes luck also plays a major role in science and this is one of the, one of the best vaccines in the world it's a travelers vaccine any time you travel to africa you need to actually take this vaccine you can see the history of vaccine is phenomenal you know you have the live attenuated vaccines so many of them you have the inactivated pathogens you have the protein based vaccines you have the viral vaccines we still don't have a proper dna vaccine as yet but now this year we got actually two rna based vaccines so this is an amazing feat uh, in terms of vaccinology and how it has made a difference to human kind 1979 a hallmark year you know eradication of smallpox and we are trying our best to see if we can eradicate polio another big achievement if we can if we can achieve that there are just a few cases that are being reported in some countries and hopefully if the vaccination continues we should be able to eradicate polio very soon the third one on the list is they are trying to see if something can be done with measles but one of our biggest challenges in the field has been the anti vaccine lobby that does not want to get people vaccinated and that's going to continue to keep this reservoir of the, these diseases continued how are viruses and bacteria grown viruses they cannot multiply on their own they need a living cell they can be grown in cell culture in eggs in organs on certain laboratory animals 
not all viruses grow on all cells. Some viruses grow on certain cells. It's important to find the balance in terms of which virus and which cell combination, and that could be used for developing a vaccine. What does a virus do? It infects the cells, takes over the machinery of the infected cells, and produces more virus, eventually leading to the death of the infected cell. What about bacteria and yeast? Well, they can be grown on synthetic media to generate the vaccines. What are the different types of vaccines? Well, we talked about live attenuated vaccine. What it means is a weakened form of the virus of the bacteria, and it can grow but does not cause the disease. It mimics the organism in the best possible way. So these vaccines are probably the best vaccines that one can generate, but one needs to have the right balance that it is attenuated enough not to cause the disease. Polysaccharide vaccines have made a lot of difference in the meningococcal and the, hemoph uh, the pneumococcal and the uh, hemophilus influenza vaccines. Currently, these are one of the big, most successful vaccines. We have a 16 valent and a 23 valent vaccine available for these diseases. Recombinant vaccines, this is coming into fashion. We have seen a lot of at 26 vaccines. Currently, there are recombinant vaccines for Ebola based on vectors. Uh, COVID vaccine, again, based on vectors like AD5, AD26, or the chimp adenoviruses. DNA vaccines, a lot of work, very successful in animals, but so far not successful in human. Inactivated viruses are one of the best old standard way of doing it. Our Covaxin and then the Sinopharm and the Sinovax are all inactivated vaccines. We also have a very successful inactivated polio vaccine, rabies vaccine, influenza vaccines. Inactivated toxoids have made a lot of difference in the world against diphtheria, pertussis, and the tetanus. They're basically, you take the toxoid, take the toxin, detoxify it, and then absorb it onto an adjuvant to produce a fantastic toxoid-based vaccines. A huge development in recombinant, uh, recombinant protein-based vaccine. Hepatitis B was the first one. Now we have the ursulular pertussis, papilloma virus, meningococcal, and a lot of different. The Novavax vaccine is another example of a recombinant vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. And the mRNA technology has actually made the difference. You know, what is amazing is mRNA vaccines have been tried. The platform have been tried for so many diseases, including HIV, and it did not succeed. I tell you, we have been extremely lucky. It has worked for SARS-CoV-2. Can you imagine if these vaccines were not available? There would have been a paucity of the vaccines and the number of deaths would continue to have increased. So if, if you look at the landscape of the different types of vaccines, you can see a lot of these platforms are being used for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. How are the vaccines manufactured? Well, you know, there's a very strict guidelines that are provided by the regulators. It's called the GMP. It's called the CGMP. C stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices. There's a discipline in the regulatory documents that tells you what are the mandatory requirements. You need to have a dedicated facility where the product can be made only one product can be handled at one time in that facility. You have to have a controlled heating, cooling, ventilation system that controls the air that comes in and the air that goes out. The water quality has to be good. There has to be topmost quality and procedural controls. The staff has to be trained. Raw materials have to be very defined and of GMP grade. Equipment has to be validated, controlled, calibrated, and operated as per SOPs. You need to have your manufacturing procedures documented and need to perform that absolutely each time. There is no scope of changing once a SOP has been established for manufacturing. And the testing lab, all the instrumentations have to be calibrated, maintained, and operated to written procedures. So this is a discipline that needs to be followed by every manufacturer when vaccines are done. And most of the time, what happens is if there's an issue, the regulator, a regulatory agency like the FDA comes in, inspects this, and most of the time they find the SOPs have not been followed or the raw materials have not been managed well. And once that happens and they see consistent, they issue a kind of a termination and you're not able to undertake that manufacturing campaign till the time you solve it. 
In terms of the procedure, how, how do we develop vaccines? You know, first is the transfer of technology to a contract manufacturing group. There's a phase of process and asset development where you define the process. Then you do the GMP manufacturing and then you release it. You need to actually do storage and stability studies, and then you need to ship it out to the clinical trial sites. So it's very important to follow these procedures as you develop your vaccines. A manufacturing facility is usually can be broken down into three parts. This is the area where the manufacturing takes place. This is where the building utilities are there. That is your heating and cooling system, your air handling system needs to be placed up here. And this is a process related to in terms of the water, the decontamination. So if you look at any classical manufacturing facility, it will be a three tiered structure. Away from the manufacturing facility, you will have your office room. You have a material storage room. You will have your testing labs here. And the vivarium or the animal house has to be outside of this area. It should not be in the vicinity. So this is the basic manufacturing facility layout that needs to be done. In terms of the inside part of it, this appears too complex, but essentially like we in a house, you know, we have the bathroom and the, we have the bedrooms and the dining rooms. Similarly, in the case of the manufacturing area, you have areas where you will have the media preparation and you will have the small manufacturing activities. This is where the large activities take place. The filling will take place in a separate area. This is where the stored material. And in order to enter into any of these areas, you have to have one entry and one exit. There's not cross flow. You cannot go from one area to the other area. People have to be trained in terms of how they actually perform these activities. Coming to the process of manufacturing, let's take the example of a viral vaccine like measles, mumps, rubella. This is a live viral vaccine or the attenuated vaccine. So typically you grow it in, uh, you could grow it in cell stacks, in tissue culture bottles, in fermenters, in bioreactors. And then once you produce your harvest, you infect your cells and you produce a harvest. So you will find you will have the virus, you will have some DNA and you will have some protein. So it's a mixture. What you need to do is then actually go through a process of purification. And once it's purified, you see you have eliminated your DNA, you eliminated your broken down protein, and now you have your intact virus. And then you formulate it and you fill it. And this big, and then labeling followed by storage. And all through the process, you are going to do the testing. So your manufacturing for a process for your live attenuated vaccine is pretty straightforward. About an inactivated vaccine, similar procedure. But what happens is you have to now inactivate the virus before you fill it. And this is an example of a rabies vaccine. Same process, grow it, infect it. So you get a lot of virus and DNA and protein. You go through a protein purification process, purify the virus, inactivate it, fill it, store it, and you do your testing. So similar procedures between the two uh, types of viral vaccines. In case of a toxide vaccine, you grow the bacteria in a fermenter, lots of organisms. In the supernatant, you will find is a toxin. You detoxify the toxin, and then you are able to, this is the detoxification process. You adsorb it onto alum, and here you have your tetanus toxide or your diphtheria toxide. All through the process, you're doing a testing. So viral vaccine, I just described to you, a standard procedure is you growing the cells, growing the virus, purification, transferring it into a formulation buffer and doing the fill finish. Now you talk about the RNA vaccines. There's a procedure of making the RNA vaccines where you take the template of the plasmid DNA, you convert it into the mRNA, you put the in vitro transcription and the five prime cap of the RNA, you do the purification, formulation, adsorb it onto nanoparticles and do the fill finish. A little bit about mRNA vaccines, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines, they can be really designed very quickly and they can be manufactured within weeks. And you can actually do and plug and play. That means all you need to do is change the sequence and the same platform can be applied. And that's the reason this vaccine has really been so effective in the pandemic because we have been able to make the vaccine in the shortest period of time. We find it's highly immunogenic and neutralizing antibodies have been produced as well as a T cell response. And what we have seen is that you can be pure, you're able to purify to the highest purity levels. 
And this is a little bit more about the RNA vaccines where essentially you make your RNA, you coat it with lipid, you fill it, administer into it a person, and you generate a strong immune response against the uh, spike protein in this particular case. A little bit about the immune response. Um, you know, basically, our, our body has many, many different areas that can provide immunity to us. And many of us may not know it, but the adenoids, the tonsils, the lymph nodes, the lymphatic centers, the appendix, thymus, spleen, Pierce patch, bone marrow, all play a role in an immune response. And when you look at the pyramid, you find that basically your skin is the greatest barrier. Your mucous membrane is the greatest barrier, including the enzymes that take care of the microflora. The second layer is the phagocytes, natural killer cells, macrophages, and then comes to the classical antibodies, the T cell and the B cell responses. Many of us completely forget about these two parts and are focused only on T and B cells. But remember this pyramid, you know, it's, it's amazing. A, 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 a human body is absolutely phenomenal in terms of how it can protect, a disease, protect, protect against a pathogen and infection. Now, when all these barriers are crossed, that is the time you actually start seeing a disease. So you can see that at a, under a normal circumstance, we are never at a state of rest. There's always some infection or some activity happening within the immune system. And this is depicted in this cartoon. You know, the perfect world is no infection, no disease. Everybody is happy, but this never happens. Our body is going through a lot of trauma constantly. You know, we are getting constantly some kind of a pathogen is entering into our body. It could be a stomach bug. It could be a virus or, uh, you know, your, your T cells are in uh, action. Your B cells are in action. What needs to happen is at some stage when all this is occurring, a state needs to achieve where your body's immune system takes care of these pathogens and achieves a state of balance. When you look at how vaccines work, you know, there's a classical, this is called the innate immunity. Our body has the ability to withstand any kind of infection that takes place. And this can happen within hours or early days. And then she kicks in the adaptive immunity where the response is more specific. And then the, it kind of dwindles. But in the meantime, what you're getting is you're getting B cells producing antibodies and T cells producing an immune response and you get in the state of a memory. And it is important that every vaccine should elicit a good memory response. What this then does is the next time you get an infection, the response and immune response kicks in much faster. Let's talk about the coronavirus timelines from the beginning. There are many different theories that have gone about, but this is one of the theories floated by the WHO. What they say is around the December 8, the first patient developed symptoms at Wuhan. And then China alerted the WHO that there was something happening, some kind of a pneumonia which was very different. And this was at the end of 2020, 2019. And then on January 1st, the Wuhan seafood market actually shut down because something terrible was happening there. There was a complete you know, disinfection of this entire area and the world was cut out. We didn't know what was happening here, but something really serious happened here. Around January 7th, they identified the new virus called COVID-19 and the sequence was deposited with the WHO. And it was amazing. The moment the sequence was adopted, a lot of laboratories started working on it, vaccine groups started working on it, and the development of vaccine actually went on a warf footing path. And this was amazing. Can you imagine within a month, you know, we were able to achieve a point where the vaccine development began. And this is unprecedented for any particular vaccine. S somewhere around January 11, the first death was recorded, and then one outside the China was recorded somewhere on January 13th. And then things just went out of control. So you can see that this timeline tells you that from the time of identification to the time of working on the vaccine and how it started spreading across the world. This year, 2020 has been amazing. Once the genome was released, you know, people started working. There were preclinical studies commenced and by May, the first phase one, phase two clinical trials started. It typically takes sometimes five to 10 years before you can start a clinical studies. And here we were able to do it 
the world was able to do it in a span of five months, which was phenomenal. And then we uh, the world modified the way things had to be working. And we didn't go with the standard approach of doing a phase one, waiting for the data, then doing a phase two. Concurrent trials started. And around December, you know, some of the countries started having an emergency use authorization for some vaccines. Now, how did we achieve this? So th this I pulled out from the WHO site. They have a wonderful landscape uh, tracking system. And this I downloaded today. I was hoping to do this today, uh, yesterday. I was hoping to do it today also. But what, what, what you can see here is about 108 candidate vaccines are in clinical development and about 184 are in preclinical development. And this is unprecedented. And this tracker system gives you a good idea of what is actually happening continuously. This is a great link for you to actually keep abreast with the vaccine development across the world. How effective are the vaccines? So the BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are the mRNA vaccines. And basically around November 2020, this data shows this is the efficacy rates. So you can see most of the vaccines here, 95, 95, the Sputnik 92, which is an inactivated vaccine, uh, sorry, ad, ad, uh, ad 5 vaccine. And then you have the Novavax, which is a protein-based vaccine, the Chimp Adno, uh, or the Covishield vaccine, which is being manufactured in India, the Johnson & Johnson, and then you have the Sinovac, Sinopharm, which are all around 50 to 60 percent. So you can see the efficacy is pretty good. I think when we started initially, we were ready to even take a vaccine which would have been 50 percent efficacious. But we are lucky that you know some of our vaccines are more than 90 percent efficacious. What are the leading vaccines? So these are the different companies. Uh, these are the technologies. So you can see the two are the mRNA. You have the ad 26 and the ad 5 from Russia, which is a Sputnik. This is the Oxford AstraZeneca or also the in India, the Covishield. And then the ad 5, which is a Can Sino, then Johnson Johnson ad 26. Again, a lot of protein vaccines, inactivated vaccines. And here essentially, you know, there was a question Dr. Modak had asked is basically the focus has been on spike protein and the whole viruses. And there is a lot of effort that is happening on other, other proteins also. And what people have shown that if you raise, if you take the spike protein and look at the antibody responses, you're getting very strong responses to the spike protein, neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein, and that is able to neutralize the virus in a pseudo neutralizing assay. So hence, it is pretty clear that at this point, if you generate strong immune response to the spike protein or to the, um, uh, to the sorry, to the spike protein, either a binding response or a neutralizing antibodies, you are able to take care of the virus and blunt the infection. Hence, predominantly the focus has been on, uh, on the spike protein, but we are also looking, the world is looking at responses to the other proteins they do see responses to the intracellular proteins, but the spike protein predominantly is important in terms of producing a neutralizing response. And this is the authorization in different countries. <clears throat> I'm uh, Eddie, I think uh, Dr. Modak is raising his hand. Can we take a question on that slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay, Eddie, there is one issue with spike protein, which uh, is known probably, but nobody is talking about. And that is spike protein is very unusual protein because it has a lot of so-called forbidden peptides. The people have done the databases of oligopeptides, and there are a series of peptides which are forbidden. If you make pentapeptide database, for example, universal, it's about 3.2 million types of pentapeptides you can get. Now, out of these, there are forbidden peptides which are not found in any animal protein or plant protein or viral protein. And spike is special because it has something like 11, 11 spike of COVID-19, 11 forbidden peptides are present. 
that makes it very unusual and that's why i think the the whole issue about uh, using mrna vaccine in terms of stability of mrna vaccine i question it because i think there will be a lot of uh, uh, lateral recombinations occurring in this region all the time yeah so i let me see if i have one slide you know i had incorporated yeah this particular one you know um so this is the wild type uh, sequence yeah and uh, and what we have found is that if you look at the delta uh, delta variant you start seeing two changes here and a, a one a couple of changes here the difference right. between the d delta and the delta plus is one additional mutation and yes. this is between the lambda so mm -hmm. you you are right um, what i have done is i've taken down your question and um, you know i i must say that i don't have answers to all the questions but i will definitely speak to folks who are more scientifically savvy on this yeah, particular really? area and i can get I, back to you I'll, I'll i'll i agree with you i will get back to you later on sometime when you have time because i we have some very exciting story to tell but not now later okay great thank you thank yes. you for raising the question thank you yeah let's go ahead so in the US, um, you know, Operation Warp Speed was established in May 12, 2020. And I tell you, this is one of the greatest efforts by the US government. And I wish every country in the world could replicate it. So they understood something was not going right. And we need to do something at a big, large scale. So what they did is they formed this organization. And they said, this is the standard path for developing vaccines. It takes about 73 months. This is not acceptable. We have to accelerate the development. Now, how do you accelerate development? You know, in the classical way, what people do is because they don't have unlimited money. They do a preclinical study, wait for the data. Then they do a phase one, wait for the data. Then they invest in manufacturing. Then they invest in phase two, wait for the data. Now, this organization funded by the uh, American government said, we are going to pour the money. We don't want things to be done sequentially. We want things to be done in parallel. So while the preclinical work was being done, they were already manufacturing the vaccines and the manufacturers were already thinking, how can we make 300 million doses of vaccines and ramping up the whole system? So everything was done at risk and the risk was financial risk. No quality risk was taken, no regulatory risk was taken, no risk was taken to the safety of the volunteers. It was just a financial risk. And they actually produce the vaccine for phase three before the phase one was done. And I'll tell you this particular slide. What they did is they invested on platforms. They said, we are going to invest in mRNA platform. We are going to invest in a replication defective live virus. And we are going to invest on a subunit vaccine platform. They also opened up another opportunity for live attenuated, but they knew that would be difficult. But what, what has turned out to be that that gamble really worked because they invested, they can convince the companies to go ahead and invest in process development and manufacturing. And what has turned out to be is we have got now two mRNA-based vaccines. We have got two replication deficient vaccines, and we have got two uh, vaccines which are based on protein. The Sanofi GSK is a little bit behind, but this effort, this gamble has resulted in five vaccines that have got emergency authorization and are now in phase three studies. So, you know, this is a great lessons learned for all of us. The question is, would we be able to put that same level of investment again? And that is a discussion point that is continuously happening. I talked about the standard timelines when you do everything in a sequential manner. So it takes about preclinical studies take 18 to 30 months. Phase one takes 30 months, phase two takes 32 months, phase three takes 30 months, phase four takes, you add it up 10 to 15 years. This cannot happen in a case of a pandemic. So what has been done is why, you know, it, in this case, there was a lot of research already going on. And in two months, the preclinical work was done. In six months, they did phase one, phase two, phase three, almost, almost instantaneously. The moment the data was coming in from phase one, they were already planning the phase two and the phase three, and now the phase fours are happening. And what it shows is for the COVID vaccine, 12 to 16 months, and this is phenomenal. Now, what has happened is the bar has been set very high. 
the regulators have now got used to this kind of approach. So what is going to happen going forward is we are not going to accept this. We are going to expect this or even better. And this is the renaissance in the vaccinology field for us. A little bit about the variants. Uh, so all of you have heard about variants. So we have the alpha, which was predominant in the UK, the beta, which is South Africa, gamma is Brazil, delta is the India. And there are other variants of interest which are not having, the, 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 the transmissibility is not, or virulence is not very high, but we call it variants of interest. Now the question comes is the current vaccine is based on this wild type. How much cross protection are you getting against uh, the variants and there's a lot of studies that are ongoing. What we are finding is the the current two uh, the mRNA vaccines are providing reasonable protection against these variants. Uh, some of the vaccines are not providing protection, but what this has done is this has pushed Moderna and BioNTech to start making mRNA vaccines to the other variants also. So very soon, some of these uh, variant vaccines will also get into clinical testing. And the idea is you could prime with an alpha and come back with other variants, uh, other variants so you can get better protection. So this is another new concept that is happening in the field of vaccinology. This was an amazing study. You know, This is a concept by a company called Codagenics. What they have done is, this is a sequence of the SARS-CoV-2. They've introduced about 500 codon optimization. They've modified the codons in a way where the virus can grow. It is not neurotropic. It does not produce the disease. So what they found is th these are the plaques of the wild type virus, which are big. And this is the, co uh, the, the codon, uh, uh, codon uh, de-optimized uh, viruses. They grow pretty well, but they don't cause the disease. And this strategy has elicited excellent responses in pre-clinical studies. Um, this was manufactured, uh, clinical batches were manufactured at the Serum Institute of India, and they have entered into clinical studies. It would be amazing if we are able to get a live attenuated vaccine, but people will have to tread on this strategy very closely. But the preclinical data is very exciting. Are there any lessons to be learned? Will we handle time things better the next time around is the big question. Because if you don't learn your lessons, that's bad. So what comes out is basic science investment can pay heavy dividends. We have to uh, invest in R&D. Without that, it is going to be extremely difficult to work on some pandemics that arise. We have been successful in the case of the, 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 the current vaccines against COVID because there was a heavy investment in, uh, in terms of the NIH for working on SARS viruses in general, investing in mRNA technologies. And because the technology was in a, in a right place, we were able to rapidly produce vaccines. Redundancy is critical. You cannot focus only on one platform. You have to work on different platforms. So it is important to actually embark on multiple strategies like the nucleic acid vaccines, the inactivated vaccines, the replicating vectors, non-replicating vectors. Surveillance is critical. The WHO has a devoted cell that is constantly monitoring different viruses across the globe. And if you don't do that, you are going to be surprised by some of the new viruses that come in. mRNA ready was, was ready for prime time, but not the sole solution. Durability will be important. Time will tell how durable is the response based on the mRNA vaccines. And this is where what we call as the um, uh, strategies where you may prime with one particular uh, uh, modality and come back with a boosting agent. When one vaccine crosses the finishes line, challenges arise for others in clinical trials. So basically the mRNAs have gone through, but now the bar has gone up. So all the other vaccine trials that are going to come through will have to meet this baseline and meet at least that minimum criteria. Vaccines aren't vaccinations. What it means is you may have the vaccine, the best of vaccine, it may be in your freezer, but if you don't test it properly in human, and you don't control the regimen, don't get the data, mine the data, vaccines are not going to be good. So it's important, the implementation. 
also need to work on drugs and antibody strategies in parallel. Complex priority schedules are hard to execute. Keep it simple. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult for execution. Cold chain packaging matters. What we have learned here is that if your vaccine is stored at minus 70, it's going to be very difficult to deploy. So you need to try to get your vaccine and store it at 2 to 8 and distribute it at 2 to 8. And this is one challenge that is facing us. There's power in numbers. What that means is you have to do your trial in large numbers in order to have confidence. So some of the clinical studies that have been done have been done with minimum 30,000 volunteers in each of the trials. We have not done a great job in testing this vaccine in pregnant and lactating people. And this is going to be a bit difficult because this population will come into the vaccine area a little bit late, but this is probably the best we could have done at this time. Vaccine inequity is unacceptable. The other day, actually yesterday, I was listening to a seminar and my head hung in shame. In the US, we have vaccines that is enough for twice the population. In Africa, only 6% of the people have been vaccinated. And similar is case is Bangladesh and other countries. So this inequity of vaccine is unacceptable. We have to do a better job, make these vaccines available to the world at the same time, not deprive people of vaccines. So we have to work extremely hard with the governments, with the manufacturers to make these vaccines available to the entire world at the same time. We need to invest in manufacturing capacity so that we can deploy vaccines in the pandemic. Mix and match. So this is what I was talking about is homologous and heterologous prime boost. What it means is homologous means you can have one dose of the mRNA and one dose for and the second dose of the mRNA because it's the same platform is homologous. But now what they're doing is one dose of the mRNA followed by one dose of a viral vector and that is becomes a heterologous prime boost. In our HIV, we have found the heterologous prime boots produces a better responses. And in the next six months, you're going to see a lot of data on COVID where heterologous prime boost is going to be uh, producing superior immune response and higher durability. And this is what is called as a mix match. We need to strengthen the WHO. It's an organization that needs to be provided with technical and political support for performing investigations finding out why are these diseases happening? Was there any laboratory leak or was there some effort to hide some research? We need to provide support to the WHO for modernizing surveillance and sequencing variants. And I have uh, kept this link as a, a lessons learned uh, in order to give us much more idea in terms of lessons learned. So, you know, coming to the end, you know, again, if you remember my first slide, we may not be able to connect the dots looking forward, but can only connect them looking backward. Trust in something, trust in your gut, destiny, life, karma. This approach has never let me down personally, and it'll make a lot of difference. So thank you for your attention. I can take more questions. Yep, Kim. Excellent presentation, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, very informative and a lot of questions, but uh, limited time. So I will leave it there right now. Thank you. So let, let me just formally thank uh, Dr. Sayed for a fascinating talk, uh, fascinating and a very informative talk. And uh, also for his last slide for the lessons that we have to learn for, for the future um, so that you know uh, the pandemic or things like that do not happen again. Um, so with that, uh, we can take some audience questions. So, uh, yes, uh, yes, Dr. Dosh, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Edi, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I just have a question related to the stress uh, generated because of the vaccination and the infection going on together. Is there anything which uh, you can just uh, uh, stay, I mean, inform us about? Is there any stress being generated because of the vaccine which leads to the mutation? Uh, such evidences are there or does the kind of uh, things happening because of that uh, mutation are happening more in this case? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think what, what uh, there's so much of literature in the field which says um, 
you know, when you have a virus that enters into the body and you have an immune response, there's a combat. And that is the one that actually forces the virus to start mutating because of what the virus needs to do is to survive. And, 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 and the more pressure that is applied, the more mutations that occur. So the question is, can the immune system take care of the virus first or will the virus produce a mutation that will overcome the immune system? So this is a constant biological warfare that is happening within the body. And good vaccines are where you have a multifaceted response. And that actually reminds me, you know, it tells me that, you know, what Dr. Modak was saying, that if you have a response to multiple epitopes, a response to multiple proteins, you will get a much stronger immune response. You should have a balanced T cell and a B cell response because just basing it on one, one epitope could be disastrous. Okay, so let's uh, let's take the second question. There are a lineup of questions, so we can have uh, uh, short answers and uh, brief questions. Uh, Dr. Karmakar, do you want to ask your question now? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I must say it was such an excellent presentation, and I was uh, somehow involved in the vaccine also for some time at CRI Kasoli. So I can well imagine what he was talking and I was really uh, appreciating his talk. In such a short time, he could, you know, uh, cover so many different aspects, almost all aspects comprehensively. Uh, my question is a little different in the sense that uh, because I worked in TB program, so BCG vaccine is a real necessity, you know, for the TB program. So. Can you give us something about BCG vaccine, whether it, is, whether it is in the pipeline, whether our country is able to meet the demand, it will be a huge demand and BCG vaccine uh, not only prevents TB, but it's an immunomodulator also. So it's very important. So I just want to have his views, comments on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Karmakar, thank you so, far, so much for the question and uh, for your kind words. Um, you know, I, I used to work at Serum Institute of India and uh, I, was ha I was handling the MMR uh, activities and next to our lab in a different building, we started a pilot facility for BCG. And what we found was um, that the amount of vaccine we made in the pilot plant as a test was enough to last us 10 years. So in terms of productivity, it was phenomenal. And we were able to use that that particular vaccine uh, because the demand was for as an immunomodulator, as you mentioned. And um, uh, you know, after having joined IRV, uh, you know what IRV did is a couple of years ago we acquired the clinical assets of a company called Eris that was focused on TB. And now we have taken this under our umbrella. Uh, we have exciting data from phase three. Uh, with some with two candidate vaccines and we are actually going very strongly in order to generate more data and collaborate with Serum Institute. So I would say in the next two years, you are going to see some exciting data come out from these clinical studies. But you know, today, as you're right, TB is a bigger work, uh, killer than any other disease in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, um, yes. Can we have uh, Dr. Jagannathan? And then Dr. Raja. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Saeed is an excellent presentation. Uh, uh, a nice, wonderfully presented. I just have only two brief questions. Uh, there are, uh, as, you as you have shown, there is a several manufacturers or several types of vaccine ma making. I focus on mRNA and let us say the killed viral vector. If these two killed virus vaccine is made, for example, our Bharat Biotech is making in India, and mRNA, as I said, Moderna or Pfizer companies are making. If we look at these, they are focused on specifically on the spike protein, whereas this killed viral vector is, uh, uh, killed virus is mostly, uh, we get a broad immune response. So if you get a broad immune response, uh, I feel it is better, as you are also mentioning, is a relatively a better vaccine in a time-tested one, and mRNA is certainly a very fast and the latest technology that is used. And in terms of getting both humoral response and the cell-mediated response, the long-term effect of the cell-mediated response of the memory has not yet been fully tested, but it is only it is only assumed. Whereas in the case of 
this uh, other killed virus it is it is shown in other cases that they have a long term effect also so if somebody comes and asks you which vaccine do you take do you prefer among these two that uh, a killed viral vector a viral vaccine may be a much better one this is question 1 and question 2 because there is huge number of questions so i want to finish both of my questions and leave it what is the role of scientists in preventing such events for example now the world is feeling that it is nothing like a bio war whether it is uh, lab leak accidental or incidental let us leave the point at right but this is happening and if we no action has taken it is going to be another disaster some other even small countries also can attempt such kind of things with uh, some requirements for putting up a lab and then do this so what is the role of scientists in preventing these disasters to occur so these are the two questions that you yeah dr jagannathan uh, thanks thanks for the kind words um, and i'll try to address your questions so you know i I'd, i'd like all of you to take a, a a walk down memory lane okay go back to january 2020 go back to march 2020 and we were seeing a new virus we didn't know what was happening okay at that point and then you see the numbers of people who were dying in new york city and there was something like 300000 deaths a day and there was no control and india the surveillance was still going on okay so we were in a situation where we would have said i am ready to take turmeric i am ready to take jadi booti i am ready to take anything if i can save myself okay now at that point what happened is the good part is a lot of companies using their standard platform technologies embarked on vaccine development so a company like uh, moderna that specializes in mrna said okay we can make mrna vaccines let's find out the protein or the sequence that is important and they embarked on that platform Russia did the same thing China did the same thing as well as Bharat Biotech did the same thing today we are in a very luxurious position we have we can pick and choose can you imagine if only one vaccine was available what would have been the situation so today our perspective is different so i would say one thing is i'm happy that many companies worked on different platforms and the modalities and actually you know three modalities have worked today if tomorrow you know imagine a situation no, now not you have to see no i appreciate the multiplicity i have already appreciated that point my yeah. point is when we want to compare between a broad spectrum immunity and a specific immunity which one is better that is my specific question okay now when you see the efficacy of the vaccines what you have found is the mrna vaccines are somewhere in the 90% and the others are in the 80% okay is 80% bad compared to 90% i would say no but what i would say is actually time will tell us let us wait for one year let us see the responses let's see the durability of the responses what we are seeing is that currently all the vaccines you are seeing a durable response a good virus neutralization antibody responses maintained for over a year and that is the reason why people are now talking about boosters so the short answer to your question is having a vaccine against multiple epitopes multiple uh, proteins is always going to be better okay um sarav do you want to unmute and ask your question no, you uh, have to skip my second question uh, yeah mahek just one more thing okay. i give it go, go ahead response. yeah so you know w- one thing important for the scientists is ethics okay whatever we do do with honesty uh, don't hide things follow the rules and regulations now there is this great theory that is going on which says that probably the origin of the virus may be have a laboratory leak that may have occurred okay let's assume it is true so if it is true then what does it tell you it tells you the failure of the lab in order to follow conditions for and not report it appropriately so i think each one of us you know we have a moral obligation to follow science because ultimately we are all responsible for the health of people so if something goes wrong some experiment doesn't work don't hide it accept it that is the moral obligation we all should have okay shall i ask uh, the question 
Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, this is after Dr. Raja. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, uh, Eddie, it's, it's great. Uh, happy to have, still consider you as my senior in Pune. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, uh, I have a point to make. Uh, I hope you don't mind. And then a question. Um, I somehow feel, see, I'm working in this field for when it started. I'm doing a lot of testing. I somehow feel that the West has gone for the S protein vaccine. Maybe it is working for the for alpha variant, alpha, the first one. But uh, like the uh, previous question was asked, the durability of uh, the vaccine, uh, when you have all the whole of the viral covered, uh, might. Uh, Rajan, you're not coming through. No, you're not coming through. You may have pressed mute. Is it? Can oh, you yeah. Hear me yeah. yeah. I'm talking no. from uh, the other phone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Quickly, um, I, I find that somewhere there is another solution, and maybe you have the answer. Because we know 95%, or at least in India, 95%, maybe US, 90% people don't need any treatment. Most of the people I know, they came out of it without symptom or mild symptom or maybe slightly severe enough, but no hospitalization. So can we find that 5% using some real good markers rather than by age or other things? Okay, if we can find that, then we can isolate them, we can treat them, and then the rest 95 can happily work. So is there a way to find it? If I belong to 5 or I don't belong to yeah, Raja, you know, firstly, nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, I remember the time we met in Bangalore, yeah. um, had a wonderful time. And, and and thanks for all your great work that you are doing. And, you know, you, you are right, you know. So, the, you know, I, I actually have been listening to a talk by a scientist called Bala Pulmi Dharana, you know. And he works in a field called systemic uh, systems biology. And his work is mainly on actually looking at various markers uh, so what he does is they look at about 200, 300 markers and they try to de determine the difference between a vaccinated and an unvaccinated person, between a person who gets a disease, a person who takes a vaccine, and between a survivor and a non-survivor. And they're trying to create a profile. And that profile will probably help us do something like a genetic testing and say who is more predisposed to a particular disease. So it's a very exciting field. A lot of work is being done in that area. And um, you know, I would say that at this point, we don't have an answers to all the questions. We should be open for information, learn. And uh, the next 10 years is going to be amazing, I tell you is. It could be as simple as people could go, do a fingerprinting and identify what diseases you're predisposed to. So it's, it's going to be a new era of science going forward. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, sort of. Go ahead. Um, hello, sir. Firstly, Hi. thank you for this wonderful talk. You, as a student, you've definitely made me feel that the uh, concept of uh, vaccine production is way more than what I've read in textbooks and through research papers. My question was more regarding computational technology. I was recently introduced to the term of uh, in silico approaches. So I've read a lot about that in uh, um, drug testing, wherein they have made in silico models with respect to heart, brain, and they've tested a lot of drugs. So should we be expecting this kind of an approach in vaccine development as well? Or have there been attempts to do such kind of an approach in vaccine development? Yeah, they definitely, you know, is I tell you, the field of vaccinology is so phenomenal. Um, and um, uh, I attend, I would say, on an average two lectures a week uh, on different aspects of vaccinology, especially correlated to the COVID. And the areas that fascinated me is uh, there was one person who talked about innate immunity. He says, you know, each one of us has, has something called an innate immunity, which is not specific to the pathogen. OK, and the longer you maintain your innate immunity, the better is your outcome in terms of your protection. And, and they are believing in actually giving you non-specific uh, treatment 
that can help your immune, innate immunity stay uh, longer. Then there's this fascinating field of scientists who believe only B cells are important, antibodies are important. There's a group that feels only T cells are important. And there's a group that actually feels you need to look at the different cytokine profiles, the transcriptomics and the proteomics. And I tell you, it is fascinating because as a scientist, you have to keep your mind open. You don't have a perfect answer. If you don't look at things in a holistic manner, you could be misleading science. And, and, and this is where the field is going. <clears throat> OK. Um, I think we can take the last question. Um, I'll come back to you, Dr. Modak. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kamath, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, hi, Eddie. Um, I've been always curious as to why is it said that, you know, um, even people who have contracted the disease and recovered from it should be vaccinated. Isn't, um, you know, if a person has got the disease, wouldn't the antibody response or the immune response be to multiple epitopes? Wouldn't that be what we are looking for as to opposed to giving a vaccine? Why are we insisting? There was yes. a study actually recently, um, you know, a paper which said, people uh, who had got the disease tracked after 10 months and still have memory cells. So why should we be vaccinating people who, uh, who have already recovered? Yeah, Dr. Kamat, a very good question. You know, if you ask my personal opinion, uh, actually, if you get the disease and you generate a natural immune response, you don't need to take a vaccine because you, you, your body will actually see the virus in its most native confirmation. You elicit a great immune response and, and you would be able to actually generate memory cells. Your antibody titers would be high. Your memory cells would be well developed. Now, what happens is, you know, we are all in a state of panic. And when you're in a state of panic, you know, you, you don't know what is right, what is wrong. So what, what you do is you say, let's put a double, double attack. Let my body's natural immune response develop, but let me also take the vaccine because I don't want to suffer. So my, my personal feeling is actually by a large number of population who has been, who have been infected with COVID have survived. If they take the vaccine, you're depriving of so many people who could have got the vaccine and saved themselves. But, you know, each person has a right uh, to a vaccine. So if, if given a choice, now, you know, you see the way the vaccine uh, field is evolving. Earlier, we said we need to get two doses for us to actually have a good immune response. But today we are saying because there's scarcity of vaccine, let us at least take one dose. And one dose may also generate enough immune response to protect yourself so that your disease severity reduces. So these are things that over, over a period of time we will learn and we will fine tune. But at this point, you know, a lot of things are going to happen. A lot of lessons will learn. And then, you know, we'll create our own encyclopedias of what is the best thing to do and hopefully you know we don't have to face a similar situation for a long long time thank you you're welcome okay we can have the last uh, comment question from dr modak <clears throat> thank you say this is very nice talk and a very nice gathering let me let me ask you the following question if you look at the three-dimensional structure of a polypeptide, any protein to that matter, the, the epitope type of situation, normally the epitope slip because the crystal structures are not the real structures. They're frozen structures. In life, the, uh, the protein parts move like a um, noodle in a pot of boiling water so that you have the epitope switching and epitope slippage that is constantly happening with respect to any particular antigen that, sorry, any particular protein, target protein that is given. And if you have unusual peptides in it, like we have found in silico, then this problem of can be either rather very strong slippage or frozen system altogether. This is something you should think about. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But this is a very serious problem. SARS to COVID is completely different sequence than SARS-2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Both Dr. Modak, yeah, you, you know, you make, a, you make a great point, you know, see what happens is, you know, when you look at, if you were to develop a hierarchy 
and have a preference. You know, what is the best kind of vaccine? A live attenuated vaccine is the best vaccine because it mimics yeah. the structure in the best way. You have an infection, you have the polypeptides expressed in the right conformation. You generate a polyclonal antibody response to the conformation, which is important. Now, you, you are not able to actually make a live attenuated vaccine for every pathogen. So the next best is the inactivated. So you take the whole organism and you inactivate it. Now, if you're not able to do that, then you go to more synthetic technologies like the DNA, the RNA, the polypeptides. And we all know that if the linear peptide is the one that gives you a protection, it will work. If it doesn't, you're, you're going to have a long, like let's, let's take the field of HIV, you know? Why have we not succeeded to make a HIV vaccine? Because we have just not hit the right structure. So, you know, I think it is, it is going to be a, a, a case where you would try every approach for every disease and the one that elicits the neutralizing antibody and gives you prote uh, uh, neutralization is probably the one that will be the first generation vaccine. And then as time goes by, the other modalities will come into picture. A fantastic area of science we are still learning. Yeah, but you see this problem is not solved by mRNA vaccines because when you put in mRNA, a lot of it, a lot of newly synthesized antigen appears which is yeah. then good target for making bodies, a vaccine. I understand yeah. that. But the, yeah. it doesn't change the fact that any movement of the regions or slippage of epitopes or modification of epitopes or hid, hiding the epitope in the cluster combination of a polypeptide, that cannot be avoided by mRNA vaccines either. Yeah, I think, you know, where I'll tell you where mRNA is coming into picture, you know, is let's say you have a disease X that comes into picture, okay? The traditional way of making a vaccine or getting into phase one clinical trial takes three to five years and we yeah, may not right. have the luxury. So yeah. what will happen is your, your mRNA will be the initial plug and play. You will try to actually get into clinics, try to create protection, try to control the infection. But the, you know, the prime boost strategy, the second heterologous boost will probably be one from a different modality that will provide you broader protection. I think, you know, yeah. five years time, we'll be sitting across a tea at coffee table and saying, yes, that's the way to go. Can I just add a point here? If you yes, please. Yes, please. I think, I think as far as the SARS-CoV-2 is concerned, this antigenic shift and antigenic drift, which falls under the category of what our Modakji is talking about, has not been so far determined, detected so far, because it is only mutating, but there is no drift in the antigen city. There is no antigenic shift or antigenic drift. These two are not found. That is the, yeah. at least lucky. Luckily, these two have not happened so far. Yeah, you, you have therefore, hit the nail. Therefore, the vaccines yeah. that we are having so far so good. That's the yeah. current situation. You have, you, you have hit the nail at the right point. Can you imagine if a SARS-CoV-2 was like influenza, where would we have been? Yeah. Okay. So, so I think you know. I you know. I tell you is, I'm I'm a strong believer in divinity, and I say we were lucky. There is a divine force up there that gave us the mRNA vaccines. Okay, it helped us control things. Otherwise, we would have been in a very serious trouble. You know. So, uh, I, I think we just got lucky with the mRNA vaccines here. Okay, well, uh, so we have come now to the end of this fascinating, wonderful session. Uh, two wonderful talks by Professor Kanan and then uh, by Dr. Sayyid. Um, Kanan, sir, any parting words? So the basic question is, as uh, Eddie rightly said, either you look at the uh, B cell or T cell, what is doing the job? So one other question which still remains unanswered is, what is the antibody seeing? Is it seeing a sequence or is it seeing a confirmation? Modex question also comes to that. It keeps on moving. So what is it trying to see? Will it catch it at the right time? What is the KM of that antibody? These are the issues which come. So I think the question what Modex raised is very fundamental. And all of us have asked, what is the antibody seeing? Sequence or confirmation? And I think it's a lovely way to end a talk that we have to find out what is happening. And I must say, thank you so much, Eddie. Uh, and um, 
of course uh, mehak has managed it very well because she herself is uh, you know very much into phagocytosis so you know i'm sure she would have had some questions to ask on phagocytosis yeah yeah i had a list of questions but maybe uh, another time no no we'll have uh, another session we'll have another one yeah. more session. because if this yeah. has generated so much you know he, what he has given is a such a big topic into a jpt file you know <laughs> jpeg file yes. absolutely i mean <laughs> plan mehak and raja let us plan a one day one let us go slowly on to it okay you know so that you know all of us get educated of various approaches because many of us have our old ideas some youngsters or some new idea let us put all of them and i think i'm sure i'll be happy to organize if we can have a one day what is it sohan Yeah. So Han, yes, I think we should have one. I think it was a very valid uh, points raised, you know. And I am very happy that yeah. Sohan is. I haven't seen him change at all. I think he doesn't mutate at all. <laughs> huh? Am I right, Eddie? Yeah, <laughs> my episodes are changing. My no, Kalvin sir, you can't <laughs> compare him with a virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, Sohan is infectious. <laughs> But worse than virus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you asked fascinating questions, Doctor Modak. Thank you for that. And I would just like to end by uh, saying that you know uh, this pandemic has been devastating, has been unprecedented. But as Eddie had mentioned in his talk, it has also led us to this uh, scientific renaissance in terms of vaccine manufacturing. I think. if we didn't had the pandemic this silver lining would not exist uh, people yep. probably now will expect um to have a vaccine manufacturing maybe in a year or so um and i think it would have never happened if um, if this pandemic wouldn't have hit us so challenges bring out new opportunities and that is always the case yeah <laughs> thank you, thank you so much it's yeah and of you and uh, you know i was very happy jignesh and all joined us i think we had a spectrum of people who joined this from all over the world i think thank you so much and uh, next one is going to be on carl landsteiner and i'm having a speaker who is a transfusion medicine expert who has discovered a lot of new blood group dr sanmuk joshi uh, who has over 40 years experience so next 23rd we'll be having dr sanmuk joshi Carl Leinsteiner and transfusion medicine. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Everyone, have a great night. Bye. Yeah. Thank bye -bye. you. Yeah. Bye bye. Hope we get to talk. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.